right, so today we'll be talking about chapter six, psychological impediments to uh, cogent reasoning, uh, or otherwise known as shooting ourselves in the foot. And so what we're talking about in this chapter is a lot of psychological aspects to our thinking. Welcome, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna get started here. Uh, so chapter six, we're talking about uh, psychological impediments to cogent reasoning, which is otherwise known as, I guess, shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, there's a lot of psychology in this uh, particular chapter. Uh, I think I had mentioned before that psychologically, we, we're not really good reasoners. There's a lot of things that get in the way, um, how we develop evolutionary wise, um, shortcuts to thinking, kind of being uh, a little bit lazy on stuff. These are all things that hold us back from making really good uh, inferences. So that's what the chapter is mostly about. So in particular, they start talking about um, loyalty, uh, provincialism, and the herd instinct. And this is where you see a lot of like evolutionary aspects uh, that influence our thinking and how we work with others. So the first concept is that the success of the group we belong to in their competitions with others. So this is how we get our basis for loyalty is that we, you could see on a survival uh, scale that, you know, it made sense to kind of group with other people, right? Uh, that's why we have sort of like this, our most basic I think is our family, right? That already it's like, well, who's part of our family, who's not? And we take kind of special care to look out for people who are in our family, who we consider family, right? The second is that then it kind of leads into this herd instinct, right? Where it's like, okay, well, I'm loyal to this group. And that means that we operate as a group. So it's not me as an individual so much, but as this is the family, right? And it, makes sense on some aspect and in, in some cases is this is where I think the difficulty lies is to identify what situations where this is this kind of mentality or this kind of approach is working for us and when it's working against us so on the pro side when it's working for us uh, you can see that in in our chances for success in any sort of project or anything that we do. So if you have family and friends, if you have that group that's help supporting you, it actually makes things a lot easier, right, in general. So that makes sense, that's a pro side to it. But then there's another side to it. Um, this is where we have a bit of cultural lag. So what they mean by cultural lag is that we take these traditions, these beliefs, or whatever we have, and then maybe they're not useful anymore. Maybe they've worn out their use, but we keep them around because it's kind of part of our tradition. But this can hurt us uh, in a lot of different senses. So take, for example, a family, let's say maybe it was useful to kind of, uh, maybe acquire things when, or make use of anything that you had. Uh, I, I really identify with this example that I think about with my family is that uh, when my grandmother was growing up, you know, this was during the Great Depression and, and they needed anything. I mean, you know, whatever they could, you found a pot or whatever on the side of the road or something, you would pick it up because it was useful, you needed it. Uh, anything like that, which is good in one aspect, but then it's kind of 
what I've noticed is kind of like that tradition I kind of passed down uh, to my mother and then to myself. And then now it kind of like we become kind of pack rats, so <laughs> you know. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. I already have like five pots at home. Do I need another pot? You know, uh, I already have you know this or that. Why am I kind of hoarding this? You know. And so that that's kind of an example of a cultural lag where we tend to keep those old beliefs going around when it doesn't quite make sense anymore, so it's a different context or a different situation. This can also happen, I think, a lot in a lot of moral issues as well. So whatever your grandparents thought was right or wrong, you know, they kind of want to keep it that same way. You know, they don't want to change their beliefs. Uh, they don't want to see people maybe in a different light of what was acceptable what was not acceptable back then, but what is acceptable now, they might be really resistant to uh, be more open-minded about that kind of stuff. So that's what they mean by cultural lag. And kind of that herd instinct that you want to kind of like that loyalty to this group and you kind of want to keep that thing going. Are there questions so far? Uh, no, no, sorry. My mic is not working sometimes. Okay. Now, we're very social creatures as human beings, and so we, we love to, or we prefer to work with groups and, and have that sort of group bond with other people. Um, but again, this is kind of where it can work against us as well. So provincialism is this natural tendency to identify with behaviors favored by groups which we identify with. So that's saying being part of the group, and I, I think a really easy example of this is like maybe high school or something, right? Or middle school even, I think even stronger, so bad for middle school students, right? Uh, they want to be part of a group. They want to be part of, it feels good to be part of a group. Um, but in order to do that, sometimes they have to kind of go with the group and, and kind of believe or behave in ways that, you know, that the group identifies as the right way to behave, you know? So if you want to be popular, you should do this or that. And so then we kind of favor that. If you want to be part of this group, then we kind of look at those things that they're kind of telling us, maybe not directly, maybe indirectly, that are cool and that's, that's what we should do. And then as a result, we kind of try to change our minds, you know, to see that as actually cool. So maybe we didn't think it was that great, you know, but uh, if the group starts telling us that's great, then it's kind of like that element that we have where we're like, well, I guess it is good. We try to kind of convince ourselves that those ideas or whatever they're doing is the right thing to do or is, is actually good. So maybe, you know, at first you might be reluctant and after a while you're like, well, actually, no, it is good. And, and you kind of, you know, sell it to yourself that, that that is like the best approach or the right way to talk or live or treat people. And that's where we, of course, you can kind of see this effect. And I think that's why I said middle school or high school is a really good example of this, is that loyalty and provincialism, then it's really easy to kind of slide into prejudice. Because uh, then you'll start judging and stereotyping others, right? Who you deem who are not part of the group. Or you might even overlook things that people do within the group, you know, you don't want to call them out. You don't want to uh, kind of point out things that aren't that great about the group, you know? So if someone in the group makes a racist comment or a sexist comment or something like that, and they're part of the group, you kind of, you know, let it slide more because they are part of your group of friends. They are part of your circle. 
but then you kind of see that you kind of allow that sort of um, prejudice to kind of those beliefs to kind of like foster. And then again, this kind of works with uh, going back to provincialism is that, well, then you kind of say, well, maybe they are like that. So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the insidious part about all this is that when the group starts thinking a certain way and you don't want to crit criticize the group, you'll start to kind of like, again, change your mind and say, well, yeah, maybe they are right. Maybe all those people are like that. So you want to kind of characterize that or you might, even in the face of alternative evidence. So very simple example, if the group is saying, you know, all teachers are assholes or something, right? Uh, you might actually have a favorite teacher or something, but you kind of go along with it and then you're like, well, my favorite teacher or whoever you're thinking about is like, well, they're not like that. But then it's kind of that group pressure of like, well, maybe they are, or you'll try to see it in a way where it changes your mind. And that's where we start getting to issues of scapegoating. So when you scapegoat somebody is that you're you're putting all the blame or the errors on somebody as a kind of way to deal with it so if there is a problem well then it's easy to blame somebody for all these problems and that gets us into a partisan sort of mindset us versus them so there's two parts right there's this group and us so that in-group, out-group thing starts to take kind of hold. And I think easy example is politics right now. Absolutely easy example. I think this is what uh, I was talking to with a friend the other day about uh, social media and our, our consumption of social media and what we read about the news and how we respond to the news. You know, I... I see that very much right now in that um, when people kind of divide themselves. So it's not even necessarily all the time that somebody else is calling them something, but sometimes we, we divide ourselves into that group of, well, I'm liberal, well, I'm conservative. And these terms have, I've noticed, have nothing to do with politics or less to do with politics. Uh, in the, in the sense that somebody like a political philosopher will talk about liberal and conservative. Instead, we've kind of like used these words to describe two types of people. And that's where we get into, well, it's I belong to this group and then there are others. And there are many, <laughs> there, there are many uh, situations where online I've had a disagreement with somebody and they say, oh, well, you're conservative or well, you're liberal. You say, well, I never said I was either. You know, I just disagree with what you're saying. And this kind of throws them off. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know. They already came with the assumption, the stereotype that, you know, if you disagree with them, then you must belong to the opposite group that they consider themselves. When in fact, I say, well, no, I don't really, you know, Feel like I belong to either group, so it's not really a group issue. It's something else that I'm pointing at that I disagree with. And this is what I think the book is trying to kind of communicate as well: that to be a good reasoner, you need to have an open mind, and then actually admit, which is going to be a very difficult thing, and we'll talk about it right now, that. You know, somebody maybe of the opposing group. So if you're conservative and you don't like liberals, or if you're liberal and you don't like conservatives, that the other group might have a point about something. It's like, oh, wait a minute, this person actually made a good point on that issue, even though I don't see them as part of my group. And that's really, I think, kind of hard for human beings to do, is to kind of put those personal feelings aside and say, hmm, that they actually have a good reason or good argument or something. The other aspect psychologically uh, that might hold us back in certain ways is superstitious beliefs. 
Uh, some of them are kind of benign. They're a little funny, kind of silly, you know, like a rabbit's foot or something. But other times people get really, uh, I want to say, uh, committed to their their superstitious belief that, you know, they can't fly on a plane unless they have their favorite shirt or something with them. Or it, it can go from silly to very serious, I think, within that spectrum. So how they define in the book uh, superstitious belief? It's a belief that's based on biased evidence or on a small or unrepresentative sample. So the, why that's different from a sensible belief, because both sensible beliefs and superstitious beliefs are based on some sort of evidence. It's like I saw something that convinces me that this is true. But the difference is that with superstitious belief, it's what we call cherry picking. It's you're picking the, the situations that already fit with your belief. You're not looking for the situations that go against your belief. So that's why it's really biased. Uh, and it's actually it could be unrepresentative or very small. So if somebody is convinced that if they wear their favorite football's jersey, that every time they do, their team wins, you know? And what could be their sample? What could be their experience? Maybe the last Super Bowl, it was true. They were wearing that uh, particular jersey and their team won. Uh, maybe the first game of the season, they were wearing the jersey again and, it, and the team won. And what they tend to do from those particular two situations is then they uh, generalize, right, and say, well, ah, well, it's proof for me. They won the Super Bowl. They won the first, you know, game of the season. And I had this jersey. Well, I, I don't want to take this jersey off every time they play. So we're, we start kind of like cutting, you know, and notice, this is where I, I think uh, it's really interesting psychologically, that it, you can't just characterize people and say, wow, that's just really silly, or that person's really stupid to believe that. Very smart people can be superstitious. It is something about our human psychology where we look for patterns, we, we want to believe certain things, and sometimes we do so much that we're willing to ignore evidence or other things that go against that. So that's where we get to the concept of wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is that we're believing, like I said, so much in something that we want it to be true regardless of the evidence. And this leads into self-deception, right? We're, we start kind of deceiving ourselves you know, into believing something. Uh, easy example, this is why even uh, what you might consider really smart, intelligent people can fall for this as well, is I think like relationships, right? So wishful thinking about a partner, thinking, well, they're, especially early on, I think they've done a lot of psychological studies on this, that early on when you meet somebody, you know, you can't see any, uh, errors. You can't see any problems or anything that's wrong with their personality or, you know, you, you're kind of blind to all of that. All you're paying attention to is the good stuff, the stuff that you really like, or, or you'll turn it into something good, right? So they do this little annoying thing and you think it's cute or something. And that's part of that wishful thinking. So you start believing that the person is something that maybe they're, they're not. You're seeing stuff there that maybe not, maybe that's not really there. And that's really tough to, to see past. Uh, like it says here, when the stakes are high, we have a natural tendency to see. And what would be the stakes in a relationship is that this is a potential future partner, right? This is maybe somebody you see settling down with. This is. This is your future, right? And the more you kind of entertain that, that this person is, you know, your future partner that you're going to settle down with and spend the rest of your life with, you're, will, you're more willing to, to start 
overlooking some well a lot of people call now red flags right you say well wait a minute they they kind of don't always tell the truth you noticed or they kind of you know twisted the truth a little bit there you know when they told a story or something and you kind of overlook it it's not a big deal and then you notice they kind of did it again but it's really hard for us to say well wait, maybe this person's not who we think they are maybe they're not always honest and truthful as much as we like them to be and so that's part of the wishful thinking is that you start believing that they're maybe a little bit more honest than they really are. Questions so far? No, the, the, everything's clear. Okay. And then, so the next step that happens psychologically too is rationalization. And this is what I was kind of touching on right now, is that in order to keep up this image, this idea of somebody or something, right? It, it could also be with objects too. So what they call buyer's remorse, like when you buy a car and it's not really what you wanted, it's a, but then you kind of like, instead of, you know, admitting that maybe this is not what you really wanted, you'll kind of try to tell yourself that, oh, no, 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 it's actually better or it's even more than what I wanted. Uh, you'll start to kind of make things about the car or something, uh, features or add-ons or, or things that you say, oh, well, you know what, I even like this better. So you, now you're looking to kind of keep up that belief that you didn't make a mistake. And that's what we talk about when we talk about rationalization. Uh, when you ignore, deny unpleasant evidence in order to feel justified, right? And what you're doing and relationships again always I think are a really good um, example of this where we try to justify an act of violence or own personal code so if you for example if you wanted to be a really honest person and you notice your partner kind of like it's not so honest and they kind of kind of rope you into this dishonesty, right? You, they kind of expect you to go along with the lie. Maybe you're telling another person something, right? And, they're, and you know they're lying, you were there, but you kind of like, well, I want to call them out. And you kind of like, it's a lot easier actually to kind of go along with their story. And then we start creating a story for ourselves where maybe we don't feel so good about you know, joining this, this story of lies, but, you know, then we'll start going, well, well, actually, you know what, maybe it is, maybe they are right. Maybe it really did happen that way. Or, you know, oh, I didn't see everything. So yeah, I'm not really lying. Maybe it actually did happen. So we notice how, what we do it. It's very, I think, interesting. I think this is why I got into psychology uh, early on was that I find it fascinating that as human beings, we, we're really good at creating these stories and these narratives for ourselves that kind of keep a particular image of ourselves. We don't want to lose that image. And so instead of admitting that maybe we lost that image, maybe we, we see ourselves as honest and maybe we became dishonest, instead of admitting that, we're, we'll start creating reasons why we didn't lose our honesty. It's like, well, it's not a lie, you know, or yeah, well, it's mostly true. And then you notice we'll start making all sorts of uh, reasons to, to keep up the image. And interestingly enough, the book also mentions uh, procrastination, which I thought was funny, is that this type of rationalization, this sort of justification, making up these uh, lies for ourselves but that in a way so that we believe it um leads to a lot to procrastination so and this can this sort of self-deception can it says can affect an entire nation and i think this is maybe something that we're dealing with as well you know that when we put off what is important because we kind of don't want to deal with it 
it leads us into some bad situations. And I think the COVID-19 virus is a really good example of that, where, you know, I think it's, a, it's very hard for some people to, to let go of their old lifestyle, to not be able to go to restaurants or clubs or anything that they wanted to do or, or were used to doing that. That was part of, you know, their every day. And so you see a lot of these events where, you know, they throw COVID parties or something, or they're like, I don't have to wear a mask. I don't need a mask. And it's this inability to deal with some unpleasant realities, you know, instead of admitting and say, okay, no, there's this virus out there. It's very deadly. It's dangerous. And we need to take precautions. Uh, it's a lot easier sometimes for us to kind of say, well, I don't need to deal with it. It's not an issue. And we kind of say, well, it, it's not something that we need to tackle right now. But I, I think that the statistics have been showing that, uh, that we just passed the, uh, I think, 200,000 uh, mark of deaths from COVID in the United States recently and this I think is a again a good example of where we're a consequence a very serious consequence when we're reluctant to face the the reality of the situation and and you know take certain steps and this leads us to what is commonly called defense mechanisms and they're done unconsciously. This is the tricky part of, uh, a lot about of psychology is that a lot of these things that we do, these behaviors that we have are done unconsciously. We don't realize we're doing them. So it's really hard to catch them. This is why the whole concept of a, a therapist or a psychologist is somebody essentially on the outside of your mind, on the outside of you, on the external, that can see what you're doing. Because it's hard for us to see for ourselves what we're doing. If we're telling ourselves that this person is right for us, when all the evidence is showing that maybe they're wrong for us, it's really hard for us to see that. But notice friends, people on the external, therapists, much easier for them to spot that, much easier for them to say, wait a minute, it doesn't look like this person is good for you. And they'll maybe point out particular situations like, well, they borrowed a lot of money from you and they never paid you back. Um, you know, they kind of talk bad behind your back and stuff like that. And, and again, that wishful thinking kind of kicks in, of, you know, we want to see the best in people, uh, but sometimes, that leads us to see that, you know, that they're more honest than they might really be. So that's where it undermines our ability to think critically. That we remember again, we want to keep up this image that we have of ourselves. And if any sort of evidence or anything that kind of like, you know, comes to us, you know, confronts us that that's going against that image, more than likely our defense mechanisms will kick in and we'll try to, you know, not see it. But of course, it's all coming unconsciously. It's not an effort where I'm going to sit here and think, okay, I'm going to ignore this. It's very subtle and very insidious where it kind of sneaks in and we'll just try to, or just conveniently, you know, forget. It's really easy to kind of forget about something, distract yourself with something else, you know. And that's where that suppression is working in. So we're avoiding thoughts that are stressful by not thinking of them. This is, this is how a lot of people with anxiety kind of function is that, you know, there's bills to be paid, um, responsibilities, job, uh, family, all this stuff is going on. And it's really stressful situation. So, our defense mechanism will come in as suppression. We're saying, well, you know, it's too much. It's overwhelming. I want to deal with it right now. I'm going to do something, you know, 
to take my mind off of it. Which sometimes is beneficial. I don't want to say it's all bad. It's, we develop these defense mechanisms for particular reasons. Maybe they do help us deal with some levels of, of anxiety. However, those are short-term effects. Those are not long-term. The bills are still going to be there, you know. Uh, maybe you want to forget about them and you go to the store or go shopping instead. But the bills are still there when you get back. Um, you still have some sort of responsibilities to your job and, and things like that. So suppression is, it, it starts off with these uh, mechanisms that are somewhat helpful in some situations, but you can see how they can come back uh, to bite us later in the long term where they're actually doing us more harm. We're not taking care of our bills. We're not taking care of the things that we do because it's just too much to think about. And of course, that leads us to denial, right? <laughs> this as a classic defense mechanism of just saying, it's not there, right? Uh, from suppressing it, just not thinking about it to uh, the next step of just the straight up denying that it's an issue at all. So the way they define it is having benign thoughts rather than stressful ones. Uh, it's less threatening then, right? So it's not as bad. Uh, I've seen this happen, especially with people with suffering from long-term uh, health problems. Uh, diabetes is one where some people have a real difficulty, you know, uh, having to to deal with the, a long-term sort of lifelong sort of uh, ailment. And sometimes it's just easier for them to deny it. It's less stressful. So doctors will say, well, okay, you know what? Uh, you need to change your diet. You need to eat these things. You have to stop eating these things, you know. And I see some people, unfortunately, just ignore that evidence. Just say, I'm just going to keep eating what I want. Even though a doctor had told them, you know, you need to change your, you need to change your lifestyle, um, it might be really stressful for them. They might find it really invasive and stressful that it's just easier to, to keep living the way they have. Um, also too, right now, politically, I would uh, point out, you know, that's, uh, I think the recent situation uh, with the passing of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that, you know, uh, some politicians have claimed, you know, before uh, that we shouldn't elect um, a Supreme Court judge until in an election year and then until after a, a new president is elected and then now have changed their story and say, well, you know, you're putting words into my mouth. I never said that. And so I, I find it interesting. These are good examples of where some people just go to straight to nails. Even though on record, you know, they said that before, there's documentation. Um, those straight to said, well, I didn't really say that, uh, despite that evidence. So human beings, like I said, we're these mechanisms, these, these aspects of ourselves developed for particular reasons. They didn't come out of nowhere. Um, they served us some purpose in maybe calming ourselves down, uh, dealing with anxiety in some cases. But uh, I think we're seeing a lot as maybe our interactions in the world are getting a little bit more complicated. Our space and like, who we interact with, uh, social media, all these things that uh, civilization hasn't really dealt with before uh, can become really overwhelming. And this is where uh, some of these defense mechanisms will, might actually do us more harm than good. 
So two responses to this, right, is that humans do deceive and that can lead to wishful thinking, right? Which what I was saying, it could be harmful. And self-deception wishful thinking can provide important survival benefits as well as harms as that point I was making as well. That, you know, maybe it is helpful that uh, it helps us deal with stress or something to kind of ignore an issue for a little bit. But we have to also think about, I think this is a hard part psychologically to think about things in the long term scale that, like I said, the bills are still there even if you don't want to deal with them right now. And I have some bills too right now that I'm thinking about, you know, it's like, oh, I have to deal with all these bills. You know what? I'm just going to go eat instead or something. And, it, and eating feels good or something like that feels good. And it's, but it doesn't take away the problem. So that's something that we need to uh, take into consideration is that a lot of stuff does suffer from anxiety. Sometimes I get anxious as well. I'm a human being, like anybody else. Uh, I'll get stressed, doubt, right? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Um, but that anxiety is not going to go away unless we kind of deal with it, right? There are some interesting cases, I think, psychologically, though. If you take an intro in the psychology course, definitely you'll probably talk about this. The placebo effect, and if you're not familiar with what the placebo effect is, is that uh, when you do trial studies of medication or any sort of treatment, that we also offer a placebo, a fake medication or a fake procedure or something. So what they're looking for is to see if the effect also really comes from the drug or the treatment or is it just kind of coming from you know well since i believe it works then i since i believe it makes me feel better it'll make me feel better sort of being that wishful thinking right so that's what you do in, in a lot of studies you you don't tell the person whether it's the fake drug or the real drug uh, so you can see if actually gauge if there are real uh, responses of the real effects. But there, there are, have been some studies, interesting enough though, that have shown that sometimes people who got the fake medication or got the fake treatment actually do improve a little bit. I'm not saying they get cured or anything, I'm saying, but they do improve a little bit because they had that mindset, uh, maybe perhaps a more optimistic mindset that it was gonna work so, you know, they're more optimistic about falling through with treatment or, or more optimistic about trying things. Uh, so in that aspect, it can help us in certain cases, but to my knowledge, I don't think there's any case or situation where the placebo cured anybody though, um, that belief cured anybody. Rather, it just kind of shows us what uh, the effect of wishful thinking is, I think, for the most part. And there's a lot of pseudoscience, and they mention a lot of things about the paranormal, too. Uh, they kind of fit into this as well, that a lot of pseudoscience I see out there, uh, probably more than not, I think, in social media, uh, you can see this a lot with a lot of weight loss plans or health fitness sort of plans. I see, you know, this person, they, they should always show the before and after picture. This person was taking this, and then afterwards they lost 20 pounds. It looked great. And they throw out kind of like this sort of scientific jargon at you and sounds really legit, you know? So like, oh, well, antioxidants and stuff like that. And it sounds really great. Uh, but what should you be worried about is that, say, mm, wait a minute, some of those results sound too good to be true, right? And that's, I think, the difference with science and pseudoscience is that science actually, the results from science are not really that clear, to be honest. They're highly contested. Uh, some studies only really uh, can be justified 
by that particular situation, which we call case studies. Only in that particular case or in that particular situation, we can say something about, but it's hard to generalize from that. So sometimes science doesn't give you a lot of clean, nice answers. Uh, and that's why I find maybe you can identify pseudoscience a lot better is when somebody's trying to provide you a so-called scientific answer, but that scientific answer sounds well, too good to be true. It's too perfect. It seems to solve all the problems. I think I mentioned in the last lecture, you know, there was this uh, video on YouTube that was claiming that could solve any illness uh, with five steps or five things you can do to solve any illness. Seems like a bit of an oversell that every, any sort of disease or virus, or, you know, can be solved by five simple things. And uh, one of my favorite effects, uh, psychological effects, is the Barnum effect. This is where you see uh, horoscopes used a lot. Uh, the Barnum effect is essentially you put it in such a way that anybody can identify with it and would like to identify with it. So I'll tell you about a real life situation that I dealt with. Uh, there was a talk, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before in one of the lectures, but I went to this talk that was funded by a college I was working for. And they had a guest speaker and the guest speakers claimed that they could read faces that by looking at the the wrinkles or the you know the the formation of your face how you face like if you have wrinkles on your forehead things like that um that they could tell a lot about your personality about who you are and they claimed to be able to do this and that they were self-taught they did their own research and you know they even had a book for sale and stuff like that and in order to prove this, they said, okay, I'll take any volunteers from the audience. And they, you know, and a lot of them were actually fellow professors. And they said, okay, so, and they lined them up and said, okay, well, because you have this and this, you're a very happy person, but uh, you try to hide that, use that happiness to hide a lot of difficult things that you have to work out in your life. And then they told the next person, you know, uh, you have these reels up here and you're really, deep thinker. You're always concentrating on something. You want to see what things are really about. And they went down the line and they, and they told us. And what I noticed, you know, well, one, I think it was a waste of money because I, I teach about this stuff. But two, uh, what the person was doing was that they were not giving them any sort of negative uh, feedback. They weren't saying things like, oh, no one likes you because you have this or that. They were always positive in a sense of like, well, you're a really deep thinker. Well, I don't think anybody wants to say that they're not a deep thinker, right? If somebody's telling them that they are, or they're saying, well, you're really overcoming a lot of deep, hard obstacles. Well, all of us are going through obstacles. And what we think are really difficult obstacles, you know, it's very subjective. It's like, well, I think it's really difficult and you're telling me I've overcome difficult obstacles. Well, yeah, I'll believe you. So that's the bottom effect is that we kind of, you know, put the story in such a way where we can relate to it and it makes sense for us. And this kind of leads into the sort of identifying extrasensory perception. So that I think that was the case with this individual that he thought he could identify personality traits, something about who you are personality-wise, psychologically, just by reading your face. That somehow he could have this skill to do so. Uh, you see, the, so in cases like that, as well as I think uh, mind reading, ESP, uh, psychics, things like that, they. Uh, psychics actually are a good example of the Barnum effect. So what uh, psychics do are, are kind of take advantage of that as well. They'll 
put a lot of positive affirmations into, they'll sneak them in there. Like, you know, uh, I see that you're really struggling with life, but you're persevering and you're pushing through. And of course, you know, every, that sounds good to everybody that, you know, we all have problems. And yeah. I'm, you know, I'm going to make it. We want to hear that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's not some sort of special power or anything that they have or perception. It's really just things that we would like to hear. And it sounds really nice when somebody else says it as well. So how do we approach this? How, what do we do about this? I think prudence is a good approach to this. Tempering what we do to maximize our long-term interest. So like I was mentioning before, that short-term, long-term goals, it's like, you know what? Start thinking about, well, wait a minute, saving some money, maybe not spending it right now. What's actually good for me in the long term? Uh, I see this a lot with students as well. Do I study now or do I kind of blow it off until the last minute? And that anxiety and that stress and the procrastination, and then before we before you know it, it's time to take the exam, you know? Uh, instead of having that prudence and thinking about, uh, well, you know what, if I study a little bit every day or, or just, you know, I, it's not even every day, just scheduling, keeping to a schedule of a study schedule, uh, actually is a lot much more beneficial in the long term than just trying to blow it off and then cram at the very end. There's a lot of studies that seem to give evidence to that. So I think that's it for today. I think that was the basics of the chapter. Are there any final questions? Uh, no, everything looks uh, pretty well. All right. Shutdown is easy. <laughs> okay.